I would love to call the select board meeting to order just so I could make a plug for um, going to our mm -hmm. website that Jen so greatly put on um, the link. So anybody that is not vaccinated can get a Johnson and Johnson vaccine one and done on May 16th, Sunday, 10 o'clock to one right now, but we have 700 doses. So if we get filled up, we are, we'll probably go to three, but right now it's in the morning and at 10 o'clock. So I hope people will go that have not had any vaccine. We're down to like the last 15% of our town and it would be wonderful to get people vaccinated so we have herd immunity. So again, that's May 16th at Treehouse Brewing, 10 o'clock in the morning, there's appointments. You can go to the link and it won't go public. It's a private link until Friday. So if between now and Friday you sign up, there's plenty of spaces. So please get your vaccine. Thank and Carolyn, you. what's the age requirement now? I, I haven't followed since. I'm well, back. this is Johnson and Johnson, so it's still 18. We're, oh, I'm 18. trying to put I'm trying to put a clinic together for Pfizer, um, you know, through Bay State because that's cold chain management um, mm -hmm. vaccine that we don't have the capability for. So if Bay State um, comes down, we're hoping to have a clinic at Frontier at some point for kids um, to you know younger. Great. Um, you know, at least the high school kids down into middle school. So, um, but this is Johnson and Johnson one and done May 16th at Treehouse Brewing. That's a Sunday, 10 a.m. in the morning. You can find the link on our homepage at the town of Deerfield um, website, as well as on Deerfield Now and on the Deer, um, town of Deerfield Facebook page. So, and if not, call me and I'll send it to you. So I have a question. Carolyn, uh, do you need help um, staffing that? Yeah, actually, uh, Andrea, if you would love, I would love another, uh, I know you've done the scribe in the past. Would you be willing to do a scribe? Oh, wonderful. Sure. Sure. I have Denise and I have Tom Feidenkevich. So I'm, I really feel good about that, but um, it would be nice to have another scribe. All right, should we call both meetings to order? Carolyn, do you want to finish calling yours to order or? Well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll let Dave. I, I just, I kind of bullied in there. I wanted to put the plug in for the vaccine. <laughs> Dave, absolutely, Dave. Go Hi, Anna Lee. Uh, 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 I don't have the agenda in front of me, so I'd like to call this meeting uh, to order on uh, May 10th at 7 o'clock, a joint meeting between the uh, Town of Deerfield Board, of, uh, uh, the Select Board, and the Planning Board. <laughs> so. Thank you, Dave. I'll, I'll read the, uh, the notice for both of us, as I'll also um, call the Deerfield Planning Board to order on May 10th at uh, 7.03. Meetings normally held in our municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's order suspending certain provisions of our open meeting law. Um, typicals, <laughs> typicals, meetings are typically broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television, FCAT. I don't see them here, but um, Hopefully they'll be here. They're here. They're yeah. here. They're here. All right. And remote meeting connections are noted on the agenda on the website, deerfieldma.us. Um, so let's see, Dave, do you want to have your roll call? Uh, roll call for the board of select, uh, the select board? Yes. Carolyn Ness, aye. Dave Wolfram, aye. <laughs> uh, Trevor McDonald uh, is absent tonight. Okay. Uh, let's see, Rachel Blaine? Rachel Blaine here. Uh, Anne Mary Cloutier? I think she's here, isn't she? I heard she was. Not yet. No, Anne Mary's oh. not here. Okay, sorry. Uh, Andrea Lipson? Here. Denise Mason? Here. Kathy Sylvester? Here. Kathy Watroba? Here. And Annalie Wolf Cole here. So we do have a quorum with four being our majority voting. Um, uh, let's see, first on our agenda is to welcome our new members. 
uh, Kathy and Andrea, welcome, welcome. We're congratulations on a well-run campaign, and um, so glad to have you. And uh, Kathy, in particular, Kathy and Kathy, we now have two Kathys, so I, we can we can manage it unless someone prefers oh, to be Trevor. Catherine or Kathleen or anything. Oh, Trevor, Trevor just joined. Hey, Trevor. Hello. Hey, Trevor. <laughs> Hi there, everyone. Hey. <laughs> So we'll we'll uh, stick with both names for you unless we hear otherwise. Or you can call me Kathleen. It's I go by Kathy, but just to make it easier, you can call me Kathleen. It might right. make it easier, yeah. That's, I, I'm I'm a Kathleen too, but you can <laughs> choose how you choose. I, I I'll go by either name. We'll see how we swing. Okay. Um, okay. And I also, want to thank. Um, Paul, Alice, and Max Antes. Max actually mentioned to me that um, he'd been on the board for nine years. This was his fourth election. That's a, a lot of Monday nights, <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of paper under the dam, and um, really <clears throat> one. And we certainly wish Paul um, the best as he <laughs> works with some health problems. So um, thank you, Max and Paul. Um, Anna Lee, just for yes. a point, point of interest, um, just verify that your new members have been sworn in so they are capable of voting tonight. Andrea, Kathy? Yeah. Yeah? Good. Okay. Yep. Okay. And at some point, we'll see some photo ops, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> Anna Lee? Yes. You want to just, uh, I'm Jen. I, I'm the assistant town administrator and I work at town hall and you can email me with questions and whatever, but nice to meet you both. We can introduce all of, all of us folks. Sure. Um, Denise. Denise Mason, I think I know both Andrea and Kathy Sylvester and Kathy Wittrova has been on for a while. So I haven't met you personally. Oh, wait, maybe I did. Um, and Rachel? Hi, I'm Rachel Blaine. Um, and that's it. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel is now uh, pushing for the max uh, tenure on the, on the board. Yes. Uh, I'm chasing Carolyn. Um, Carolyn was on this board for a long time. I, I don't know. Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, thank you all. Um, Annalee? Yes. Um, Debbie Shriver wants to know who's taking minutes because Anne Mary's not here. Um, well, I picked up on minutes last time, so I suppose I can do that again. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. Shriver. I don't see her, but she must be someplace here. Good. Okay. Um, I did not see any last minute announcements from other towns. Um, we do have some other mail that was received. Um, one we sent out to the planning board um, a week or so ago, we did receive notification from the Attorney General that our <laughs> um, marijuana bylaws that were approved at town meeting last year, but in fact there was an error in the posting um, so they, we did some repostings and corrected all of that. And in fact, the attorney general has approved last year's special town meeting, October town meeting um, approval of those marijuana bylaws. And secondly, um, we did receive an email from Bob Decker, um, whose site, who is on the ZBA. Um, he cited the use regulation schedule noted some areas that may impact treehouse growth plans. I think this is an FYI. I don't know if anyone has any comments or thoughts about that. Um, I think we're going to try to uh, um, adjust our zoning um, in for the special town meeting in the fall. We normally um, would have a special town meeting after our free cash is certified at the end of September. So we were talking sometime in October. But because of the ongoing pandemic, even though everything is more or less opening up, um, there still might be some lag. So once our free cash is certified, maybe the end of October, beginning of November, we'll have um, 
the, the select board will forward um, some adjustment to the zoning for Treehouse. Um, they can open up uh, and have a liquor license with a restaurant, um, and that's not an issue. But um, if they do anything like uh, you know a pouring pub or wh whatever, uh, Dave probably knows more about this than I do. But we need to adjust our zoning for that slightly. So we will make an amendment and bring that forward in the fall. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Dave, do you have any other mail or anything else that you want to um, address as we, then we'll go forward with our minutes. Uh, we don't have any mail at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have two sets of minutes that were circulated from April 4th, so maybe and April 26th. Um, uh, maybe I'll have a motion to approve the minutes on the fourth and a second, and then we'll see if there's any discussion. I make a motion to approve the minutes of the fourth. Denise Mason. Oh, I think it's actually the fifth. I'm sorry, April April fifth. Okay, I'm sorry, the fifth. Second, Rachel Thank Blaine. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and is there any discussion on these minutes or? Additions, corrections? Well, one thing I might uh, suggest and um, is that Anne-Marie, uh, since you are you know, filling in, that Anne-Marie um, submit them from her. It's not on my copy anyway. It doesn't say submitted by Anne-Mary. Anne-Mary, sorry. Um, so that might be good because your, yours says submitted by Annalie Wolfkuhl. So. Okay, good point. We can letter of the law there. So mm, we have. Well, I just think it also clarifies it for sure down the road. Sure. It's sure. That's good. Thank you. Um, so, since we do have a motion and a second, and this was our discussion, I guess we abstain or I don't know. Do we just sort of forget about it? <laughs> uh, you can table it till next oh, week. Oh, good. Oh, that's a nice idea. All right, so we will table the minutes from April 5th. Yeah. And then we have the minutes from April 26th. If I could have a motion to accept those. I move that we accept the, oh, no, no. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, move that we accept the minutes from April 26th as they are submitted. Thank you, Rachel. And a second, please. I second that, Denise Mason. Thanks, Denise. Is there any discussion? All right, um, let's see. And we'll go back to our original uh, alphabetical order, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. Uh, and Mary's still missing, Andrea Leibson. Given that I was not at the meeting. She abstains. I abstain. Uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Uh, Kathy Sylvester. Uh, Kathy, someplace in there, um, in terms of uh, approving, dis not approving, or abstaining from the minutes. Sorry, you didn't hear me. I said I abstained. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. And um, Kathy Watroba. Yes. And Emily Wolfkull, yes. So we have one, two, four, zero. Have... Yeah, good. Okay, cool. Learn something new all the time. Um, old business, new member orientation, Denise? Yes. Um... It, it's been a little slow going, but because the, uh, the information that, that I got from town hall, there wasn't a whole lot, but I was fortunate to get Rachel's booklet that has a wealth of information. So I've gone over that and I'm meeting with Jen tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And so I'm hoping that I can make some copies and start making booklets for, new, for all of us, actually, most of the new members. Um, and we'll just continue adding as we go Go through. I mean, I don't think we can cover all of it tomorrow, but you know, get some of the, you know, 
pertinent information that is needed now. Right. Okay. And, and um, as a matter of fact, I mean, we won't be violating open meeting law if we speak with each member individually for any kind of training purposes. So actually, did, 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 sorry, you sorry. can, um, somebody has feedback, is that, um, sorry. So we can actually have a training that doesn't have, it doesn't break open meeting law if we have a training. So I think I would schedule a Zoom after everybody has their packet and we can go through each of the sections. Sounds great, thanks, Jen. You're welcome. Thank you very much for everyone who's been working on that. All right, so next on the agenda is our public hearing for the use and dimensional requirements amendment. And that's where we're glad to have the um, the select board here um, for all members and then also members of the public, our process tonight will be that we'll open the public hearing. There will be sort of an overview or presentation probably by the select board in terms of what this amendment is all about. Um, we will have comments from the public, certainly trying not to have too much repetition and, and obviously being very respectful of everyone else. Um, our options after we close the public, or we, well, then we can close the public hearing when comments are, um, well, then our, our options are either to continue the public hearing at a later date, to close the public hearing and the planning board will deliberate and vote on changes that are not more restrictive, at which point then they could go forward for the town meeting, or we close the public hearing, deliberate and vote on changes that may be more restrictive, at which point we would need to set a date for a new public hearing. That's an okay process for everyone to understand. All right, so um, I will now open the public hearing. And um, members of the select board, if whomever that might be, if you could. Um, I guess I just, it's very simple. Uh, we have a lot of town municipal projects uh, potentially coming down um, fairly soon um, in our schedule. And while Cumberland Farms uh, is a non-conforming lot, we have a senior center, the church, um, potentially Braeburn um, across the street uh, for senior housing, park project. So we would like the flexibility of having um, for town municipal projects, a 50 foot frontage requirement, which is a reduction from the 100 in the Center Village District. And we would like, we're not changing the setbacks or anything else. It's just enough of a frontage for a subdivision road, potentially. It's pretty straightforward. Can I answer any questions that any might have? Um, well, and then there's also a section in the proposal that states that uh, the planning board upon request by the applicant may waive or even reduce the setback requirements more if we feel that it's in the public interest to do so, correct? Right, and we put that in only because um, Cumberland Farms is already non-conforming, doesn't abide by the setback. Um, it's it's really an ugly thing in the center of our town. So we obviously don't want to have 21E, which is your you know contamination issues. So we certainly would not purchase it um, in that until that's sorted out. But the, if the library project goes forward, we need to have a temporary library during the project. It has the library has to remain open, and um, rather than invest money to make um, an occupancy permit um, applicable at the church. We were thinking you could, it would be a win-win to temper, you know, buy Cumberland Farms, use it as a temporary um, place for the library, and then hopefully turn it over um, for some other economic uh, activity at some point. But obviously, you know, there are setback 
issues and frontage issues with Cumberland Farms. What, what are the um, issues, occupancy issues at the church? Well, it's, it's debatable. Uh, it, well, it's not ADA accessible for sure. And, um, and that means the bathrooms. And so it would be renovations, tremendous renovations costs re involving just the bathrooms. But um, there's questions on the foundation uh, you know, the load, you, you know, the load of the books on that structure would be way, way too much without substantial, substantial work, um, several hundred thousand dollars worth of work. So if we can get a donation of Cumberland Farms or buy it at a fairly reduced rate because um, that we've been beyond the two years for grandfathering, so it's not um, any use um, hasn't been grandfathered now. Um, we're hoping to do something that would be cheaper and we could clean it up and make it more attractive. And then we could turn around and actually sell it and get our money back. So, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, it really is ugly. I mean, it, it's, it looks terrible. So. Um, Carolyn, you mentioned that um, you'd like to have the flexibility for municipal properties. I'm wondering if there are, are if there are other reasons for doing it and why, why in fact it would be different for the municipal properties than for the other properties. Well, oh, go ahead, Dave. I'm well, sorry. one of the issues is the uh, Raven Road property. Uh, we can't access that property actually with uh, <laughs> correctly off of Braven Road. So we're gonna to have to look for some type of access off of North Main Street. And that would possibly mean purchasing a piece of property on North Main Street with putting a, uh, a road through for a subdivision. And it would probably be, if we could subdivide some of that property so we could keep the home and maybe put the roadway in uh, it give us the latitude to look at uh, some different avenues to getting in there and be able to develop that pro property and back. Uh, primarily, I, our goal is that's where I think the board has looked at it over the years, and that would be an ideal location for senior housing. I guess in the um, spirit of transparency, um, if that second clause instead would be that, that the planning board could um, waive the setback requirements or for municipal properties if deemed in the public interest, but then that would then entail being able to have more public discussion rather than just um, internal discussion. Yeah. Have you well, our intent is any development or anything that we do, we would bring to the planning board. We're just not going to sit as a board and say, we're going to do this. Right. Because one, we do want public input. And, you know, and we thought the due diligence on this would be to bring it to the planning board. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what we did anything. Want. Uh, you know, whether it be the Cumberland property, because if you use supplied all the setbacks, uh, you might have been able to put one of those old photo booths there, but that was about it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, obviously for anything to happen on that piece of property, we're going to have to have a variance and that would have to go through the planning board and have right. public hearings on it. Um, the same thing with the uh, Braeburn property. Um, you know, if we bought a piece of property. Did you actually consider, um, instead of saying a specific frontage of, of 50 feet or potentially less, of just saying that, um, that the setback could be waived by the planning board upon consideration with public interest? Well, that one of the reasons the 50 foot is there is for emergency services, for vehicles getting in and out for a proper roadway. Mm -hmm. Um, so we really wouldn't want anything much narrower than that. 
Um, yeah. And Although it's saying, it would never be less than 50. Although you're saying here that the planning board could reduce the setback requirements. Oh, on the but setback. But not frontage. <laughs> Only setback, not frontage. Yeah. Right. Right. Are you in agreement with that, Trevor? Yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, the whole idea of this and, and um, you know, is again to have the flexibility when it when it comes to municipal use because it's for public use. Um, and then the the idea of um, being able to bring this and involve the planning board is that, you know, you're the only other really elected body that would and then and deals with zoning and planning. So so you would have the the, the oversight. So a select board couldn't just come and kind of decide to do whatever they want to do. They've got they've got to come before the planning board, which is the other duly elected body to, you know, to review this stuff and make sure that it's in the public interest. And then, of course, bring it to town meeting to get approval. Um, we thought we thought that was the most inclusive and deliberative way to to make sure that we're going to do uh, with having some flexibility, but to make sure that we had other elected bodies overlooking this and making sure that you know people were in agreement with that it was in the best interest of the of the residents for the you know for any reduction in in um, in frontage and then if if by any means we needed to do some some adjustments to setbacks we would bring it to this body to do that because I think our intent is really not to adjust any setback ever um, unless it really becomes a situation where it's in the best interest of the community and that that and we need to have a deliberative process and 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 your body is the best uh body to do that because it's elected and it deals with you know with this issue specifically are there other comments from the um public <clears throat> or the planning board I don't see anybody's hands up, so no. Again, I'm sorry. I'm trying to, again, understand why municipal projects would be different from any other projects in that zone. In which zone, Annalie? Well, the zone that they're talking about, which is what, CRVD, right? Right. Well, if I could take a stab at it, I, I think it's because um, municipal projects aren't uh, to the benefit, to the financial benefit of anybody. They're for the benefit of the full the, the town. So we're making a we're making a uh, some flex in our zoning bylaws, which we we feel sets up our town to serve our town, but so do the municipal projects. Um, and so if we're going to allow any flexibility, it would be to those very projects that benefit everybody, the library, senior housing, um, whatever goes on those projects. We also are sitting on a good, I mean, a good chunk of publicly owned property that we want to make use of. And uh, this, uh, I think my sense is that this allows us some, um, some more flexibility, ergo more usage of the property that the Braeburn property, we've been looking at it and looking at it. We look at it for everything, we looked at it for the library. We looked everything that we can possibly do with that property, we, we've tried. And it, it's just gonna sit there landlocked if we don't actually shake it a bit. So mm, I, I'm sorry, I sound like a proponent because uh, I am always nervous about you know the kind of, um, mm, quick fix, but I don't know that this is a quick fix. I think this is something that we see is, I mean, I, I'm, I don't think it's a quick fix, but I, I, I'm willing to hear anybody else speak on that. The other thing so, with municipal projects, I just wanted to add is that anything has to go through town meeting for financial support of the project. So it, it, it would already be supported in the town by townspeople if they have voted money for a project. So um, we feel like, you know, the flexibility, it isn't just um, that we're allowing the municipal, um, you know, flexibility here, but it's also, um, you know, you've gone through several hoops of support 
for a project that's going forward that would utilize this 50 foot um, frontage. Andrea? I'm wondering, we are reducing it to 50 from 75? From no, from 100. 100. 100. Would anybody like to look at the map for the North Main Street parcels? I would, yeah. Yeah. Can you see that okay? Not yet. Mm -hmm. You guys can't see that on your screen or you can? You can yes, now. we can, John. Thank okay. you. Okay. So when we look at North Main Street, this parcel that's highlighted is one of the town parcels. This secondary one back here is the town's parcel as well. So those total about 6.17 acres. We see the tilt and libraries right here. We know the center of town is right down a little bit. There is a tiny access point to the Braeburn lot. We know that. Um, as we actually scan in, we know it's about 35 feet wide off of Braeburn Road. The problem is, is Brayburn Road in of itself is extremely narrow. It's even more narrow than that 35 feet. So to get any vehicular traffic in here with an ambulance or a fire truck is, you know, very, very uh, heavy risk wise. You can only get one vehicle in. You cannot bypass another vehicle coming out. So uh, I think for any public safety reason, we re never really could grant that as a primary right away as we develop that parcel. So I don't think anybody in any reasonableness would ask you to lower the threshold down to 35 feet. What we need to look for is the town to exercise good use of this property is when one of these neighbors up here on North Main Street decides to sell the, their property, we really wanna try and look and put an access road in between the houses, whether we take down a garage, we leave the house up and we put a 50 foot right away in there. We know a standard travel lane is 11 feet wide. So two travel lanes are 22 feet wide. We throw in some breakdown lanes and some sidewalk and instantly we're at 40 to 50 feet wide without any problems, um, not even associated landscaping. So that's really where the 50 feet comes from. It really gives the town some, some latitude and movement to try and access this parcel. The goal is to keep the senior housing and senior citizens downtown where they can walk to the senior center, the town hall, the Tilton library, grab groceries, they're on the bus route and pretty much have everything at their fingertips. So as we look at the municipal parcels and the projects up and coming, um, I think this does make sense as a whole. This was recommended by our town council and uh, it, is, um, I can't say it's quite frequent across the state, but you know, Lisa had seen it quite a few times where there was a, a diminished um, frontage requirement for municipal facilities for the exact reason that Carolyn said. All this does have to go through town meeting. It's subject to extensive review and the town's folks really give input on it to the planning board, the select board, town meeting, finance committee, capital improvement planning committee, it's subject all the way through. So I think that was the basis behind it. And if I'm missing anything, let me know. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, no. yeah, my pleasure. And I can zoom in if you guys wanna look more or if you actually wanna see, you'll see the frontage in one second, as soon as it loads it, you should actually see the size. I think it's helpful to see for this particular property, but also try and think broadly. Um, yeah, so we see some of the properties have 78.72 feet of frontage, one's got 95, uh, one's got 110. So if you really start dividing off 50 foot access road, the question is, is do you take down a house or do you take down this back garage if this person eventually decides to sell, leave the house in place, divide off an access road through here of 50 feet, leave the house intact and resell that to someone else moving into Deerfield. And then we have a nice 50 foot right of access into this 6.17 acres. Yep, back here. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? Uh, Denise. Yeah, I have a question. 
to, um, I mean, you apparently must know who owns that property. Are they interested in selling it? Have they been approached? Uh, this is Peter's property. It was actually his dad, Les Thomas. Les taught at Frontier Regional for 30 mm -hmm. something years. Uh, amazing, amazing gentleman. Peter lives up in, uh, I think, Vermont or New Hampshire. Carolyn mm -hmm. knows him very yeah. well. Vermont, Vermont. Yeah, okay. he, he may eventually part with it. And, you know, I think a lot of us are very historic in, in our thoughts where we really have a problem taking down a house. Mm -hmm. We don't want to take down a house. But a lot of us for future development don't mind taking down a barn out back. We right. don't mind taking down a garage. And this 50 foot of frontage actually gives us a lot of latitude when it's a municipal project. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a question. Oh yes, Kathy, thank you. Is, is there any one of these more favorable than another? I mean, so this individual is known and he's known to not live on in the property. Is there any one of those that is more favorable than another? I, I have to say we, it's one step at a time and um, you know, it's, there has been some conversations, but you know, they're pretty confidential. So I, I don't wanna say too much, but we're hopeful that we can get access to that property. Well, again, I think too, we're, we're looking at this broadly, um, you know, in a, in a broad range, it, is number of properties that would be impacted. And that, and that could be, yes. I, I would, again, give an example of the Cumberland Farms. Right. Denise, did you have something else to say? It looked like yeah, you know, I was just thinking. I mean, I have no, I have no problem. I, I echo what Rachel said. I think we should be able to utilize the existing property for the town. I mean, once again, it's not for anybody's private gain. So, you know, just because of, you know, the configuration of, of the town, I mean, there's only so much we can do. So I think if we, if we wouldn't approve it, I mean, it's, it just, it just puts us in a bad position. So I, 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 you know, would vote to move forward on that. Kathy? When a vote's taken. So were there any other concerns about that Rayburn property other than a right of way, a right of access? Was there flooding? Was there, was there anything other than that just right it's, of it's dry. It's dry property, um, you know, we, and we've had it for a number of years. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been before the Senior Housing Committee mm -hmm. for a number of years. Um, but Brayburn we is just not appropriate. Uh, it's it, it can't handle additional traffic sure. and it certainly can't handle emergency vehicles and mm -hmm. if you're putting senior housing complex in we we would have small in 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 the scope of senior housing it would be a small uh, amount of units you know under 20 mm -hmm. but even so you would want to make sure you had the availability of an ambulance 24 7 all year mm -hmm. round and you know, in the winter time, especially in a bad weather, and I mean, uh -huh. that road is very, very narrow. So we'd have right. to come up with some other, you know, you can have that as a secondary access mm -hmm. and, a, and a way out, but you still need a primary access that is safe and would be available 24 seven all year round. We've really just been hanging it over the last couple of years, you know, to keep the keep it from getting out of control. They just go in and hay it every, you know, once a year. It was, it was gifted to mm -hmm. us um, for senior housing and um, we just have not been able to pursue it. But the, 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 the land itself is suitable to build on. There's, there's no other issues with it. It's really, it's really an access safety issue. Right, it's on sewer, it's on water potentially. Okay. And um, so it's it's good for senior housing. Nice. Yeah. To Kathy's point, it's not in a floodplain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have the normal water table that the whole South Deerfield has. Yeah. But, uh, it's not considered wetland. Right. Although, I mean, and I think this is really interesting to to consider. Um, that's not really the issue that's before us right now, which right. is general bylaw which could have to do with any municipal properties correct and have far-reaching effects with that 
Are there any other um, public comments, Jennifer? I just want, I don't want to be a stickler, but for minutes purposes, if you could just state your name now that we have two Kathy's, um, just if you could state your first and last name, the Kathy's, and um, yeah, just so it's clear in minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they straightened it out. They both want to be Kathleen now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, uh, yeah, I'll be either. Kathy. Just do Kathy S and Kathy W. <laughs> Let's do that. Make it easy. Um, well, I've had this problem my whole life as a Jennifer, let me mm -hmm. tell you. Um, Debbie Shriver has her hand up. Uh, Debbie? Well, just um, the, my only comment had been, or concern had been earlier, um, I mean, before the meeting, uh, was really around the question of, um, um, you know, granting a broad, you know, uh, change in, you know, for all municipal properties. Um, but I, I, I really like the fact that you know, everything that is going to happen under this uh, potentially would have to come back to the planning board, would yes. have to be reviewed by uh, any other relevant boards in the community, would have to go before the town voters in the town meeting. So there's nothing automatic in the exercise of, uh, of this activity and anything that it would, that this um, relaxed frontage requirement would grant doesn't uh, therefore give a, a specified right of any particular type of development or activity without really going through a vetting process that involves the public. And that, that all makes, just makes good sense to me. So. Well, you know, whether it's uh, expenditure for actual engineering or expenditure for actual building, all that stuff has to go through town meetings. So it would enjoy yeah. a broad uh, based support in the town for our project to move forward anyway. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, if we apparently don't have any, or do we have any other comments? Thank you. Just one side note, if anybody sees a for sale sign on a house on North Main Street, can you please let the select board go right away? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing major in the works right now for any right of access. But right. if you see one out there, please let us know. All right, good. All right, well then, if there is no further discussion, could I have a motion to close the public hearing? Kathy Sylvester, make a motion to close the public hearing. Thank you, Kathy Sylvester. Rachel Blaine, I second. Thanks, Rachel. Um, any discussion? Um, so let's see, uh, the vote then we'll have um, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, aye. K Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson, aye. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, aye. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, aye. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba, aye. Emily Wolf Cole, aye. So our, our public meeting is closed, our public hearing is closed. Um, so now we'll have uh, deliberations with the planning board and some. Yep. <laughs> Further comments, I appreciate that. I think just about everyone spoke during public hearing, but. No, apparently no other comments for our deliberations. So then we need to craft what is our, um, our motion. Um, it, I, I believe it would be to approve the proposed. It would be to recommend the um, uh, amendment. To the town. Put on, yeah. Put on the town warrant for town review. Okay. So could we have a motion to recommend this amendment to go to the town warrant? Denise Mason. I make a recommendation to move this, move this it's to go a, to the town warrant. bylaws 1792300, dimensional requirements. 
by adding a new superscript nine after principal use in the heading of the principal use column and adding a new definition of superscript nine at the end of the notes section. That's what we're moving. Thank yep. you, Rachel. Moving to approve. <laughs> and um, I will read that for our next. Publication. And I, I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the help, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Um, any discussion? Okay, so back to alphabet. Uh, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, aye. Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson, aye. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, aye. Kathy Wittrova, or Kathy Sylvester, sorry. Oops, I think we heard you almost. Oops. There we go. Aye. There we go. You have a, a lag there. Kathy Wittrova. Kathy Wittrova, aye. And Annalie Wolfkull, aye. So the, um, the motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you very much for thank your you. help and assistance. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Good. Thank you. Moving forward. OK. Um, now we have another public hearing. Um, this one on uh, for the proposed amendment to Deerfield Zoning Bylaws, Chapter 179, replacing Section 2244 in its entirety with a new Section 3900, accessory apartments, including 3910, purpose, 3920, definitions, 3930, accessory apartment standards, 3940, application procedures, 3950, transfer of ownership of a dwelling with an accessory apartment, and 2230, the use regulation. Um, so I will open the public hearing with um, sort of the introduction that um, this was an amendment that we have already, or a uh, change that we have already voted to move forward to the warrant. However, um, we then subsequently realized that there was an error in the some of the postings. And so to be on the best side of caution, um, the planning board is did correct the postings, re, reposted, and now we have another public hearing, which of course could be about the postings or any anything else about this amendment. So, um, could uh, if we have any discussion, are there um, maybe Jen, you can help with people who have their hands raised or whatnot? Sure, nobody has it yet. Up, oh, Jeff Upton. Mr. Upton. Yes, uh, I have I have several questions uh, to be honest with you. Um, I understand our existing bylaw right now allows for uh, by right in law apartments, correct? Uh, yeah, we don't, but it's by right, correct. We don't that's necessarily. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, now uh, with this proposed bylaw though, now you're talking uh, and those are attached. Now we're also introducing freestanding dwellings up to 900 square feet. Is that correct? Correct. They can be detached. So is they it, can be detached. So that 900 square to, feet is area. It's up to the smaller. Up to of, 900 square feet. Well, it's up to the smaller of 900 or, square feet or the or half the footprint. Cent. Right. Now that's just living area, correct? That does not include the, the garage area. So if somebody wanted to, if they had the size house, they could technically build a freestanding dwelling on their, on their piece of property, as long as it's what, 10, 15 feet away from their neighbor, up to 900 feet, and then they can also add on a two or three car garage. Is that my understanding? Um, I don't. Uh, the way I read 
apartments. In terms of a garage, I mean, we that's what I'm reading. Garages here. Um, uh, planning board. I mean, um, if you want to build a garage, you know, within our, it is in our bylaws to build a garage, a freestanding garage. Um, in no, accordance I'm, I'm saying, uh, Rachel, I'm saying building a house with 900 square feet of living area, if the existing house allows it. And then on top of that, you can also attach a two or three car garage on that 900 square foot house. Because the way I read it here, it says and under the floor area on the first page, the finished area above grade floors and residential structure, ex excluding unfinished areas with ceiling heights less than seven feet, attics, unfinished areas of heated space, and attached or detached garage. That leads me to believe that that's excluded. They can, they can add on, on top of the 900 square feet, they could add on a two or three car garage and still be within this bylaw. So you could have quite, quite the size of a dwelling there on that. So I'm, I'm a little concerned. There's, there's several issues that I have with this bylaw and especially I don't have a problem with the in-law apartments because those are already allowed in town. We've been doing those for years. What I have a problem with is the freestanding dwellings on a lot that has already an existing single residential unit on it. And I will pull up my list here very quickly for you. I'm these I mean, are some things. These are some of the things I have concerns with, and I, I know it's going to be a little long, but please let me speak, because this is critical to the town of Deerfield. One, we've talked about, and we've already experienced in the past, and we're in a lawsuit right now because of the rural community living. People don't want to ru ruin the rural characteristic of it. Number two. How many free dwellings are we going to allow? How many potential free dwellings are we going to allow in the town of Deerfield? Are we saying that anybody that has a residential house has the right to put a freestanding dwelling on their property? Driveways. Are driveways going to be a, a shared driveway for each lot or are there going to be an additional driveway depending on where that freestanding dwelling is located, which means an additional curve cut? Three, we've talked about this before, traffic, increase in traffic in congested areas. If we're allowing freestanding dwellings to be added in, in the area. Another, off-street parking during the wintertime. Where, where are we going to? We already have issues when there's uh, snowstorms in the evenings. Next one, high water tables. The whole town of Deerfield is sitting on a high water table. Again, it's been brought up by a, a group here and it's Deerfield Responsible Development. What's gonna happen with all the runoff on the water? when you start digging cellar holes. Next, septic, as far as sewer, whether it be town or septic, are, is, are the people with this free dwelling gonna be able to tie, tie into their own town sewer? Or are they gonna to have to go out on the street to tie into their town sewer? And if that's the case, is there going to be an additional charge? My understanding is White, Mark Whiteman got charged $1,100 per connection. Is that going to happen? Septic systems. Septic systems on these lots. When people bought these lots and built their homes, they were built and the design was done for a specific number of bedrooms. Now we're changing the game in midstream. It sounds like a bait and switch. 
So now are we going to have to go back? And if you're allowing two bedrooms, are we going to have to go back and design a whole new septic system for the two bedroom freestanding dwelling? Going to have to go through PERC tests, EPA regulations, Title Fives, and so on and so forth. Property values. You had mentioned on the first page that uh, in number three, protect, you, this is one of the purposes, protect stability, property values, and the residential character of a neighborhood. I would love to have somebody explain to me how you're going to be able to do that when you're adding freestanding dwellings on lots that were built or, or the requirements for lots for one residential structure on them when people applied, when people bought those lots and built. They had to meet certain requirements, certain qualifications on those lots. And now, there's no way that you're going to be able to do that. I would like to hear that. I've, I've got a building background of about 50, 55 years, and there's no way that you're going to be able to build single dwellings on existing properties and be able to protect your property values. They will go down. I will guarantee you that. And then you have uh, up to 900 square feet which I already talked about before, plus the garage, and that's within the 50% realm. Another item that I wanna share with you is last year at an annual town meeting in the floodplain, it was voted and approved that anybody in the floodplain, if they wanted to add on, could only add on 25 up to 25% increase in their footprint up to 25%. So you're going to tell the people in the floodplain regions that they can only increase their footprint by 25%. Does that stand for free, also freestanding? And yet at the same time, everybody else out of that floodplain can increase their property by 50%. That sounds a little discriminatory to me. The next thing you're allowing, if you allow two bedroom developed properties, single family or whatever. Now I'm not talking in-law apartments here. I'm talking about rental and that. Two family or two, two bedroom. Let's say that uh, whoever moves into that dwelling brings along two kids, two kids, a minimum for education is going to be cost of the town over $30,000. Tax what you would get for that to that dwelling, you might get maybe about $2,000 in addition taxes. It's going to cost the taxpayers of the town to cover those expenses. Your town, the way I see it, when people applied and met those requirements for their building lots, they were understanding that that would be, they had to conform to those. The town would be breaking contract requirements for building prints granted in years past, plus septic systems, and which could lead to invasion of privacy of existing homeowners and an impact on uh, the quality of life. Now, the next question is, when does an attached dwelling become a classified as a two family? Can somebody explain that? How, how does an attached dwelling, if it's not an in-law apartment, if it's a rental apartment, then that doesn't, does that not qualify for a two family house? We already talked, there's committees that are looking into senior housing right now at this time. If we're gonna do senior housing, low income or affordable housing, the town should plan accordingly and pursue grant money through state and federal for assistance. It should not be done helter skelter throughout the town with a lack of organized planning. And those are my concerns that this 
proposed by law leaves wide open and it is dangerous as far as I'm concerned to the town of Deerfield. So that's just some of it. And also, by the way, as I read through this, you have some conflicting language in some of your paragraphs. And I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying, and I'm being upfront. I do not, I support in-law apartments, no problem. Under the existing bylaw, great. But I do not support uh, the freestanding dwellings. So I think, I think it's dangerous for the town. I think it'll uh, have an adverse impact on property values for the people that have invested in their homes and in their properties and spent money to keep them up looking nice. So thank you, that's where I stand. If anybody wants to address some of those concerns, I'd love to hear it. Um, it's, yeah, that's, um, thank you, Mr. Eppner. You clearly have um, studied this carefully and um, you know, often we try to be able to respond after comments. This is quite a list though. Um, so I'm trying to think. Well, one, one uh, so let me just, um, cause I, I hear lots of um, good things in uh, Mr. Upton's concern. Hi, Jeff. Um, the detached um, apartments, I think that there may be clarity about this in terms of being over a garage, say that it's detached because the in-law apartment is over a garage. It's not actually part of the home. And so I think that it may be that we wanna shore up that so it doesn't look like we are opening up the um, opportunity for a homeowner to put up a detached, and I think we wanna talk about that. This came up once before um, the detached, I, I, the idea of a detached accessory apartment has more to do with existing, I think, properties, um, existing structures. Um, and so maybe that's a place that we want to look at that. I, I, I want to just push back a tiny bit on our current, um, our current bylaw is not, it is only for family members. So once the family member, you build a little apartment for your son and daughter-in-law, they move out, then that is no longer an apartment. So that's the important thing. I mean, that's one of the features of our, our current bylaw that is, um, causes some, some uh, pushback. Um, and I do think we wanna look at the parking. There are two parking spaces. Um, right now in the bylaw and that might be something we want to talk about. I do recall too, we did have some discussion about the septic and um, uh, that it should not be problematic, but I can't respond to that. Bob's not here tonight too. I, I kind of think he had some thoughts on that as well. The uh, two meetings ago might be good to have him. Mm -hmm. Um, Carolyn has her hand raised. Carolyn. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, the septic issue is, is it, from a board of health point of view is really serious because usually the septic designs are based on the bedrooms. So if you're adding a bedroom, probably the septics wouldn't be so much impacted. However, if you are at adding another separate dwelling, um, you know, you probably are going to have more than one bedroom. So two bedrooms are going to impact the septic systems quite a bit. But um, I, I guess I just wanted to say that um, the intent of this bylaw is really, really good. And I know the, the accessory apartment or the in-law apartment that we have written has, has issues. And I was hoping, because I've received a number of complaints, that um, mostly along the lines of what Jeff has already brought up. So we don't need to go over them again. But um, what I was hoping is that we could table this. You as a, as a planning board would recommend tabling this and 
um, for either the fall town meeting or next spring town meeting, and that we would take some time to look at the current accessory, um, you know, in-law apartment that we have by law, and then combine it with what you have proposed um, and, and know all the issues and try to address all these issues because this, this seriously will have town-wide um, you know, impact on all people's property. And I know one of the persons that complained to me accused me of having the ability to build a second dwelling on Upper Road and then renting out my house. And if, if I was going to build 150 or $200,000 small dwelling and then rent out my house. It, it seems ridiculous if you were trying to address affordability. Um, so I, I just wanna state that I'm certainly not in support of this for my personal benefit, but I think you have to look at it at each individual parcel, especially out in the residential agricultural area, you have potential to have multiple little buildings coming, springing up and I think that is a, is a real issue um, from multiple different concerns. So um, I'm, like I said, I don't think it's written really well that we wouldn't cause so many problems from a, a regulatory point of view for our building inspector, our board of health, and ultimately the residents themselves as they have these smaller buildings being put up all over the place. Um, and, and I, but the, I understand the intent. The intent is to have affordable housing. But if you're building a separate building and the cost of building that separate building, especially if you replace the septic system, there's no way that that is going to increase or enhance affordability. People are gonna do market value. And, you know, so it's, it's not really gonna address what, what the intent is or, or what, people's good intentions are. So I would like to take some more time since this is so impactful. I'm hoping this will be tabled. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Ms. Munson? Hi. Um, I, I, I am very excited about this potential for having freestanding. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in it. Um, and I'm wondering, has the committee reached out to other towns that have already put this in place? Well, um, yes, definitely. Much of the, um, many of the changes were taken from um, research with other towns. And uh, my understanding from Chris Curtis, who has worked on this considerably, is that the towns have found it to be, in fact, an enhancement to the town in a, um, in a positive way for being able to create, um, especially create uh, housing when people, so that people who live in, live in the town, or people who work in the town can live in the town. Mm -hmm. But yes. Because it, it would seem that some of the questions that were just, or concerns that were just voiced may have already been looked at and, and um, you know, could be, could be answered. Um, we have an eight acre parcel and a house that is around 1400 square feet. So the way I'm reading this, I wouldn't be able to put a 900 square foot, even though I have plenty of room, town, water, sewer, I would not be able to put, you know, more than a 700 foot. So if, if I wanted to create a single level house that I could live in with my husband, and then maybe have a child live in our house, our, you know, a family live in our house, a family member, um, I wouldn't be, so I'm looking at the 700 square foot that I'd be able to build as being too small that it, that, you know, I don't think I would bother doing it. Whereas even 900 square feet. So when I was looking at, um, I believe if I'm reading the town in Northampton correctly, that they just have up to 900 square feet. So they've 
I don't know if they have, I'm reading right now here, it says is not larger than in floor area than one half the floor area of the principal dwelling or 900 feet, whichever is smaller. So it would seem to me that a lot of this would just be dictated by the lots that are available and you know the, the utilities that are available and whether or not you could have either another water source or share a water source, or if your property could have a septic system, you know, an additional septic, because even, even if you have a, let's say if you have a three bedroom home and you're adding in an accessory apartment to it and you're adding one or two bedrooms and you only have a three bedroom septic system, wouldn't you need to expand that septic system that you already have to make it you know, a four bedroom or more so that you could get the gallon, you know, you'd have the, uh, the flow that you needed there, the, you know, the per the uh, percolation rate to be correct. So, so I, I, it just seems like a lot of these questions maybe have already be, been looked at. And so, so some of the concerns might, you know, it just, it just might be that the, the answers are already there. Thank you. Yes. Um, and I wish we could give more of the answers tonight. And I think that um, that won't happen, especially for the a good a good list of of questions. Um, do we have some any other other comments from the public? Yes, Jeff Upton. Mr. Upton, raising my hand. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to address that. I and I understand where she's coming from. Uh, comments very good as far as the house and the property, but not all properties in Deerfield are eight acres. And yet at the same time, uh, I didn't see any place there other than existing bylaws that are going to eliminate which properties can do a single dwelling and which can't, uh, you know, as far as conforming what are the what are the guidelines and we're trying to talk about for affordable housing here uh just to let you know that that's kind of a pipe dream because right now your 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 square foot per square foot is running anywhere from about 225 to 275 per square foot so if you're talking you know like around a 900 uh, square foot dwelling up to a 900 square foot dwelling. Now you're getting up into $200,000 range. And that has nothing to do with the garage. That has nothing to do with driveway. That has nothing to do with septic system. And it's fine if you're dealing with family. But let me ask you this. What happens if a developer comes in and starts buying a property and throwing single, single dwelling units in here and renting them out to anybody and everybody. That is not family. And then what do you do? You know, you, you, as, as I said before, you talk about community, you talk about the character of a community, the development, property values. I don't see how, how that's gonna help your property values. And to be honest with you, I don't really care. I don't really care what other towns are doing because I know there's been issues uh, in, in negative also. And I still, quite going back to question number three, as far or comment number three, as far as the uh, purpose, protect stability, property values, and the residential character, character of a neighborhood. Show me how freestanding developments can do that. And I just, I, sorry, I've been in the building business for 50 some odd years, been around it, and that doesn't happen. So I, I'm just not, I'm not, you know, I'm not buying the, as I said, I'm not, I don't have an issue with the in-law stuff as far as apartments. What my issue is freestanding dwellings. That's the issue, point blank, 
should not happen. That's a dangerous step for the town of Deerfield. I, I will respond and then Denise, um, that the concern of developers coming in and then renting them out, um, we did very much address this from the standpoint of the requirement that one of the two units must be owner occupied and a um, feeling that that could help uh, monitor some of the issues that people might be concerned about with having um, people who aren't, well, could be family members or not family members, but having an owner occupied requirement was important. Denise? Well, I was just going to say, you know, given all the, the public comment, which I mean, there are, there are quite a few issues, it seems, that the public has. I mean, Mr. Upton, I think Jeannie, um, Carolyn, you mentioned that, you know, I, I would like to make, to make a motion to table this and so we can look into it further and to close this public hearing. I, I don't think we're going to come to any kind of consensus this evening. Can I ask that we hear from you? We have a couple of hands up. Oh, sorry, okay, I didn't see that. Let's hear those. Um, Mr. Wolfram and then uh, Ms. Munson again. Okay, uh, it's Dave Wolfram, uh, Select Board, Town of Deerfield. Um, I echo some of the concerns Carolyn has uh, and Jeff have. Um, one is the fact that these standalone dwellings would be two bedroom. Uh, that would open a floodgate, a problem with the schools, I think, for us. Uh, I can understand maybe a one bedroom. Uh, Freestanding is very expensive right now, as Je uh, Jeff was mentioning. You know, I know, um, I just know her as Trixie's mom. So, um, but. <laughs> The, uh, the uh, you know, I my house is on a little less than an acre. My house is 5,200 square feet. And I could put on, you know, the 900 square foot where my existing uh, three-car garage is. Uh, it wouldn't be economical for me. And if it was multiple, multiple bedrooms, I think, you know, that would cause an issue. Uh, and the other thing I see with this bylaw is it actually only restricts us to people that are on town sewer. Because if you're not on town sewer and you have to modify a septic system, almost all Title V's in Deerfield now that are being modified have to be a raised system. And that takes up an awful big footprint on a piece of property. Um, you know, and most people don't have property that large for two dwellings and a large race system. So, um, and I agree that, you know, we should probably table this and have further discussions on it. Ms. Munson? Well, I, I guess I was just going to reiter reiterate the, um, what I was reading here that, you know, even if a structure, even if a home was sold, that anybody that was, that was buying it would have to also agree that if they were going to be um, having somebody in the, um, let's say the free sit standing or the accessory unit would need to abide by the same, you know, family, it be, be a family member and that it not be, um, and that it be, you know, not, let's say for short term rental, it would be a long term, you know, it, it would be a long term thing. So you wouldn't have people renting and coming in and, and, um, um, you know, using, using the property that way, it would be somebody that was living there for a long term. Um, and also just the intent, which, which I think is really lovely about this, which is to be able to keep people on their properties that want to stay on their property. So that if you did have, um, you know, you were building some, something for somebody with mobility and you did have the room on your land, um, to be able to put up a, um, a, a freestanding dwelling that um, you, you know, uh, I just don't understand that with the, you know, adding bedrooms so that you might be increasing this, the, the number of kids that would be going to school would change other than, you know, just building that could happen in town too. So I just don't see it as being something that um, everybody's going to run out do just because they have the right to do it. Um, I, I, 
you know, again, I, I, I'd be really interested to see how other towns have handled, handled some of these questions. Thank you, Carolyn. I, I just wanna say one of the issues that um, I, I had with this is there was, if you sold your house, say, you know, you were requiring family, you know, owner occupied, but how do you enforce this? The problem is we don't really have staff and this is not easy to enforce. So it would be complaint driven and it would be a nightmare for us. We would be in housing court all the time because you would need a deed restriction. There's no requirement for deed restriction here that would be automatic you know, owner occupied requirement. So from a, from a town point of view, like I said, there are so many, the intent is good. And I don't argue with the intent. We need more good affordable housing, but just reference to the schools is just the select board. We, we constantly do budgets now and uh, you know, and it's because 70% of our budget is school related expenses and, and it's not sustainable. So in any discussion, schools are always going to come up because it's affordability issue, but I don't want it to be the issue or the reason why we don't improve our accessory apartment, in-law apartment, or try to support affordable housing. That's not correct. I'm just concerned that this is not well written and that the enforcement or the regulation of this is, is a nightmare for us as a town and not, again, is not, there's no requirement for, um, you know, a deed restriction or anything like that. So, I mean, those are the issues that we need to all sit down and address and take these issues one at a time and say, look, Greenfield has a, you know, a, a bylaw like this and they've ended up in court and they've had problems. So how do we avoid those problems? How do we figure out we're not gonna entail all kinds of legal expenses because the neighbor next door is fighting with whoever wants to do this. This is a nightmare from us from a, you know, using legal fees and regulatory enforcement. So I'm, I'm just asking that it, it, we take some more time so that we can figure this out. That's all. Cause it's, it's gonna be really, really hard for us. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Denise? Yeah, just quickly, it, um, Jeff, since you had such an extensive list and since <laughs> since Annalie has taken the minutes, you know, we'll, we'll cobble together the minutes probably together tomorrow. Could you send that to her so that we have that? I think that would be helpful, your concerns. Yes, I, I would be able to, I, I, could, uh, I could get that out. Well, I probably, probably with it next couple of days okay that because would be i'm great. right out straight tomorrow but if okay. if you don't mind i'll i'll send that out within the next couple of days i thank think you. that would be that would be helpful thank you uh jennifer hi i have a comment from uh aliki fournier she says in terms of general comment and concerns about accessory dwellings there's a lack of consideration for eco-friendly net zero carbon footprint homesteads that would relieve residents of financial hardship. So, just that comment. Was that in the chat? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. <laughs> um, are there other comments? I don't see anybody else's hands up. Um, I can make one other comment that we have talked about before is looking at doing a different rental bylaw. And that would help with um, tracking, you know, family members and well, um, it, there would be a fee, but we could work on that in the future. It would help also tracking the, the, the thing that Carolyn's talking about and actually address something that Jeff referred to too, um, but the, the enforcement and the, the organization, we talked about this with council. She suggested actually that we look into, um, and Bob was here at that time in that meeting, um, that we look into some sort of inventory idea um, in the bylaw that would help us to track those apartments um, that he you know, uh, will 
obviously he does the inspection. He is, he, along with the, the select board, board of health, you know, works on these projects. Um, I don't think we want to come across, frankly, as anti-family. Um, I, I think we're verging on that when we talk about, you know, places that where families might move in. And that's a problem. I appreciate the cost, but I also would like to point out that in um, one of the reasons that we were pursuing this over long time is because we have a very low inventory of housing in our town that is um, that at a, a, a price level that people working in the town can afford. Um, and so we do want to just stay on that. So I guess I'm, you know, I, I was deep sigh of relief. I am, I do, I don't know, are we, we had a discussion point here, but I do see this as a, a move forward. I think the detached, the language around detached dwellings, we might want to really look at again. I, I will, I will say once again, that the cost is prohibitive. But people do spend it to move their families closer, to have an in-law apartment or to create an apartment for a, a, a child you know, who's returned to the area. But once that child moves on, once that parent moves on, that, that money is now just sitting in your backyard because those apartments are not available for rental. So that means that that, that is a, either, it puts the homeowner in a, an odd spot. So I don't even know that we are really truly promoting the in-law apartment for family members with this particular bylaw as it sits in front of us now. So um, I do appreciate, and I, I would like to look more carefully at the parking and septic, I think um, we have mentioned that here before. Um, any building would trigger that. So that's something again, that would make this a very expensive endeavor. Um, and not something that somebody would jump into quickly. Um, but I, I think we need to continue to pursue it. I think it's, uh, yes, it, it is not without an issue in the, in the town that, that we already are facing, that we already confront. Kathy Retorba, who is muted, muted, <laughs> there we go. So sorry. Um, so from the notes I've taken and sort of what I've gathered, we have two groups of uh, information here that we're looking at. We're looking at traffic, curb cuts, parking, septic, water table, but then we're also looking at enforcement, inventory, deed restrictions, schools, legal expenses, rental bylaws needed. So there's things that are actual to the development on a property, and then there's other issues that are related to the town and how this all functions. So I, I, I think it's probably fair to sort of make these lists of what the concerns are in each of those categories. I think that's it's a category kind of issue. Um, otherwise it's a huge mountain of where do we go and where do we start and how do we climb? I think sort of breaking it into these categories might help us. I think that's helpful, Cassie, thank you. David? Uh, I'd just like to add a side note. I know what the bylaw is saying about relatives and everything. And I appreciate that. And I understand that completely because probably a third of the town is related to me in some way or form. But um, the uh, I have a major concern with the fact when they do move out that that property would just stand vacant. I don't think the bylaw would survive a legal challenge under that aspect. Um, I haven't talked to an attorney about it, but I have, I have concerns about it. Because if you put $200,000 into a standalone uh, accessory apartment, and then you can't rent it afterwards when the relative moves out, um, I, my gut's tell me we'd lose that in court. Well, that's the way it stands now, David. I know that's with the in-law apartment, which is different. No, I mean, it's the same in our, in our bylaw right now, you can't rent it out. Yeah, but that's putting an apartment within your own house. It's right. not a standalone. Right, okay, right. But any money that you put into your, you know, apartment in your home or in the garage that is attached above your garage. Yeah. 
then that apartment, once your in-law, your child moves out, that apartment is no longer rentable. Yeah, unless you're commercially zoned, but that's a different story. We don't want to get into that one. <laughs> so, okay. I, I think it's really clear that we're not, we know there are problems with what we have, but I'd like to look at how do we fix, what are the problems that we have now and try to fix them or adjust this bylaw to address them specifically without creating a whole new pile of problems. That's all. And, and mm -hmm. like I said, I support the intent. I think nobody wants to, um, I mean, everybody wants to support your intent. Affordable housing and also um, keeping seniors in our homes are, have always been, you know, I've been working on that for over 20 years not successful, believe me. We've tried multiple things. And that accessory bylaw is one of the things that we tried to do and we didn't write it well. And so what we have to do is, is, is put a lot of effort into this. I, I know this will mean many meetings, but I also feel that the intent is really, it is important. And so I feel like it is important for us to have many meetings on this and get people to participate. Well, that's what I see is key, Carolyn. I've really appreciated the comments tonight at our previous um, public hearing. We had one family show up. Um, we have been discussing this, I believe, for probably over a year. I mean, I think Denise, don't, wasn't it on the table even before we were elected to the planning board? Well, it's been and, on the table forever. Yeah. It's and been on the table since because there is there is a potential for unfriendly development if you're not trying to our, our town does not meet a threshold for um you know housing that is affordable to the residents. Right. I, I won't even call it affordable housing. I'm just saying housing that is affordable to the residents. And so it is it is behooves us uh, legally speaking actually to keep moving forward with this. This is not a casual thing. I mean it's not you know mm -hmm. as Carolyn says not to benefit Carolyn it's it's to benefit the town so that we can you know keep people coming through our town right. um, who work here that's all it's, it's important yeah. and i think one of the challenges for the planning board as we move forward with this and other proposed bylaws is how in fact can we get more uh public input as we work on their behalf and not have it all of a sudden be <laughs> 12 contentious i know and 28 days before town meeting and significant concerns. All right, are there any other public comments? Oops, David. Anna Lee, I'd just like to make one point. As much as I hate Zoom, this has actually increased public awareness and in, well, a lot over, I mean, I sat, I don't know how many years on the board of selectmen and maybe have one person in the gallery. Tonight we have what twenty something. I mean, it's it's yes. We get a lot more people involved this way. Oh, yes, I think it's hopeful, and I know the select board has talked about trying to um, figure out ways that uh, we might be able to have something hybrid after we're all able to be back in town. I think that would be wonderful. Yeah. So we're gonna try. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Planning board, before we do anything about closing the hearing, I believe we have a couple of, of options. Um, one is, excuse me, one is um, that we continue the public hearing to another date, um, at which point we could actually even deliberate on some of these and, and discuss some of these concerns. Or we can close the public hearing and then deliberate on how we want to move forward. And um, I think those are our options right now. Um, so planning board, do you have any suggestions again to continue the public hearing until next meeting, which in fact could generate potentially some more comments or we could close the public hearing if we feel that we have enough comments about this particular uh, bylaw proposal and then we would go forward to vote on whether or not to 
take it forward to town meeting or to not take it forward <laughs> or to change it and take it forward and, and have another public meeting hearing. So I see, I see Rachel is deliberating. De Denise. Well, at this point, I think it's premature to take it to, to town meeting. And if we do want more participation, I know, you know, it's been a while, but I know that for Greenfield, I mean, that they, I don't know if they still have huge problems, but they, that was in the paper a lot. Um, doing a by right um, separate dwelling. That was a huge issue. And I, I'm not sure how they resolved that whether they made it so that it's no longer by right that it has to go before the planning board. So I think it's premature to do that. I would encourage another public hearing and perhaps getting in touch with Mary Byrne who covers our area to do a little story. I don't know whether that's opening up Pandora's box. No, I think, I think that big yeah. issue um, here is too that we could look at Greenfield or we could look at Bernardston. Bernardston, and uh, sorry, Buckland. Buckland has just liberated uh, like their bylaw accessory, but that's a very different place. Right. It's a, you know, so I think that every town has to come at this in their own way. Um, and I think that you 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 make a strong point. The so that we um, need more public comment. Yes. Are you saying then to have more to? continue the meeting for more public comment at our next meeting is that what you're it doesn't necessarily have to be at our next meeting i i would i would postpone that a little further because i don't think we're going to be able to bring it to town meeting so do we have to do it at the next meeting i mean is that is that that may be too soon i don't i don't know well i i would i think if we are choosing not to take it to town meeting, then we would need to have a vote to that, I mean, to that effect. So perhaps what we're talking about then is closing this public hearing and then having um, deliberation as to exactly what our next step is going to be. So if, if that sounds reasonable, if we can have a motion to close the public hearing, Andrea Liebson, I move that we close the public hearing at this time. Thank you, Andrea. Second. Kathy Petrova, I second that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Um, is there any discussion about closing the public hearing? No, okay. Um, so uh, then I'll call the question, uh, Rachel Lane. Close the public hearing, I or no? Uh, Me. Oh, she's thinking. I don't know. Can you smell it? Um, <laughs> oh, well, um, did we say, did I say have discussion? More discussion? No, we're, we're voting to close the public hearing. Um, I vote no. Uh, Andrea? I don't see that. What we have in the um, in the proposed new bylaw will stand, and so I'm happy. We should continue to have open to have more public hearings, but it can't be on this version. That's the thing. So your vote would be. <laughs> so no, oh. don't close the public hearing. Sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a little confused about. Let me just, let, can I just say that if we close this public hearing, it doesn't mean that we're trashing the this version. We're closing it and then we have to vote on it. So the, the work we've done to create this version, I don't know, if this is it, not, it's not like for naught. Um, mm -hmm. it, it just means that we're going to go back to the drawing board. Um, so. Right, if we don't close the public hearing at our next meeting, we will have entertained more comments from the public. And at some point we would close the public hearing and either this version or a simplified version of it could go forward to the town or we would pull it from the town. Less, less, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, less restrictive. Restrictive. 
Right. So I so okay. So I was confused. I thought we were just closing this, but we would continue. So right. we should keep, we should keep the public hearing open. So could I retract my my second? Then? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just retract my that I second. <laughs> And, I can, and I can retract. I can retract the closing the uh, <laughs> motion. I okay. just think we just need to continue to discuss it. We need to figure out what it looks like. It, yeah. If the standalone, it, honestly, if you look at it, the standalone feature, which seems to be, you know, people are most concerned about, that's not um, an impossible thing to review. I think the parking is the other one. Septic again, yes without a doubt, but any kind of building or, you know, change of use, we're going to look at that anyway, it's a special permit. So it may be that that's the, the issue. And I, I think it's important for us to think about that. I'm not, I, I, we talked about it once before um, and kind of thinking it through in terms of what it looks like. We haven't, we've been really talking as much as anything about apartments within people's homes, mm -hmm. not separate. Right. Um, and that is, I mean, that's what they're doing in Buckland. But in Buckland, they don't have, it's, their neighbors aren't as close. Right. Okay, so we do have a motion on the table, though, to close the public hearing. And there has been one no. no. And then one, Andrea, we weren't, I wasn't quite sure. So I guess I will vote no. We should not close the public hearing. Okay. okay. Um, Denise. Then no. <laughs> Kathy Sylvester. Uh, I, I guess no. I, I'm really still confused. Why can't we close the public hearing, rewrite it, open it up again? Or are we not allowed to do that? Or... Want me to answer that, Annalie? Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> so the reason you the reason you would close, if you're considering that this needs to have a substantial change then it requires an entirely new notification process. Uh -huh. So regardless of how you vote on this particular version, it would appear in listening to the conversation that everyone's identified some concerns that need to be addressed. So even if you don't vote on this particular version, closing the hearing is a part of the hearing process. Um, if you do feel like you need to go back to the drawing board on some portions of it, then you're going to have to go through a new notification process anyway. So it's, if you want to continue this discussion about this version, then I would leave the, leave the hearing open. If you want to go back to the drawing board, then you can close this and, and take a vote to do exactly that. Thank you, Casey. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> can I, this can I what just counsel is going to say. Could I just offer a little planning board experience? Sure, go for um, it. Um, this, there is enough rewrite in this or enough concern about the rewrite that you would have to repost. So my suggestion would be to close the hearing and then um, start work using this as a basis, but take Jeff's comments or whatever comments that came out tonight because you're going to have to publish this because if you don't it will be not it will not meet the attorney general's posting requirements it just needs one person to protest it and then it will be thrown out all the work you've done will be thrown out so my recommendation would be to be safe would be to close the hearing and then move forward with a new version and you know, not not next month because I think Dollar General is on your general next month. So say you're going to take it up in July or you know your July meeting or something like that, and then try to get a subcommittee. You know, Dave and I. You know, let us know. We'll we'll come. You know, Jeff invite Jeff to come and and a few other people whoever had comments to come so that you have discussion on how to address your concerns. And then you can post and, and publish the correct, the corrections that you come up with. And that way it's clean and nobody can complain. Can you get that in writing about the nobody complaining? Cause I'd love to. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Rachel, no, I'm not. <laughs> Too bad we didn't have all of this discussion before we started voting. Mm. So am I voting or are you starting over? <laughs> you can I withdraw the motion and then make a new motion if if you know to start over. I'm 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 trying not, I don't I'm just this was just advice. The, the original motion was to close the public hearing. Andrew Leibson made that. I seconded that, and then we got a little confused, and then we were, then we decided to vote no on doing that. So we can now vote yes to close the public hearing, and that's where we'll be. I vote um, the public hearing and start over personally. Yeah, I mean, oh, that's Kathy. Yes. So that's Thank you. So you voted yes to close the public hearing. Yes, I do. Okay, Kathy Watroba. Oh, this is well. I mean, given this is this is a little tricky, and not to you know elaborate, but there's a lot of work that has gone into the documents that we have, and a lot of conversation, and a lot of like settling this but there's a lot that's come to light in this meeting that's why these public meetings are so important we really need this this feedback because it, it takes uh, it takes all these perspectives from the community to to help create something that's meaningful that will actually be effective and work i think given the conversation that we have had and the work that still needs to be done i would vote to close the meeting Which puts us in an interesting situation because, Hi. because, uh, so. The chair can br break the vote because you don't need a super majority. Can we also <laughs> retract our votes? Right. Only, only if I vote no. Annalie, can we retract our votes? Because, you know, there, there was a, a big misunderstanding here. So I would retract my no vote and say yes to please close the hearing. And I would do the same. And I would do the same. I'm not even sure how you vote. This is a little confusing. It's like, where, huh? I, I, right. So, I mean, I think we've put, I think we have a great foundation but there's clearly more building that needs to be done. And, and, right. and I, I see it at the, you know, the building level and I see it at the town level, right? This, it, it, and if, we're, if we really are invested in creating something that's going to benefit the community, I think we really got to dig in and do some more work personally. So I will also vote yes to close the public hearing. So we have more or less <laughs> five yeses and one no, maybe, <laughs> um, I believe. So the well, public hearing is closed, which now means that we as the planning board have deliberations about what do we want to do with this? Do we still choose to um, have it, have this as is, move to town warrant? Do we? choose to make it less restrictive and move to town warrant? Do we choose to make it more restrictive? At which point we would have to republish and repost and have another public hearing? Or perhaps do we choose to uh, table it for future discussion? I, or not, I, th I think for future work. I believe those are our options, only four options. Okay, Annalie, I think we should table it to the future. I, you know, as Carolyn said, we have Dollar General next month and that's gonna be enough. And um, I think we should table it until July or August. And I think we should take any kind of public comment that we get in the meantime, including Jeff's, Carolyn's, um, Jean's, Jeannie's, and um, I think we should try and you know publish you know have something published in the recorder and invite more comment. In the meantime, you know, hold another public hearing later on. But don't take it to town meeting. Annalie, I, I just uh, just a suggestion. Uh, again, the select board usually has a special town meeting in the fall, 
sometime usually after a free cash has been certified, which is normally the end of September. Because of the lateness of the state budget and town meetings, et cetera, et cetera, I would think that's gonna be a little bit later this year. So I would look at the later part of October or the beginning of the first week in November. So then what you wanna do is backtrack from that, that time frame, say mid-October for to be conservative. So you need to have something published in September. So if if you know whatever work is done should be done by the end of September, so you have plenty of time to publish it for a public hearing to go on to a special town meeting warrant. So the best thing to do is to plan out when you want to do the work. So if you assume that Dollar General is going to take a little bit of time in June, then you need to be saying, okay, in July, we will start working on this. And, and we might have to have an extra meeting in July and August so that we can have a product for the town warrant by the end of September that will be able to be published. So I'm again, I'm not trying to cause and you know take over your meeting but the idea is you would want a timeline that you would actually end up having you know a product that you could take to town meeting right right i guess i would say as an aside too that um dollar general is not everything <laughs> right so but you could have spe you could have a separate meetings for just the work of this bylaw I think there's enough interest and enough concern in town that if, if it was published and, and advertised that well, this is what you're gonna work on, people might participate. Like, I, like Dave said, there is a lot more Zoom participation than ever before. Um, I would like to entertain a motion to um, withdraw this bylaw from the warrant for the June 12th. Um, town meeting no Casey's not here I don't think we have to withdraw it yeah we just don't have to put it forward it's already been Casey's here oh we put it forward already well we put we put it forward once and now we've had another public meeting well it has it has a we closed the warrant and it has a placeholder placeholder yeah. so you you should vote to withdraw it and then our if next that's what you board, want to do. Right, because our next select board meeting, we would open the warrant, withdraw that warrant article, place saver, and, and then close it again. If that that's what you want to do. Me. Yeah, that seems important that we all are in agreement if that's what we are in agreement about. <laughs> so that would be a motion to withdraw this proposed bylaw change from the warrant for the June 12th meeting. Someone? Okay, I make a motion to remove this from the warrant for the June 12th meeting for the, pl the placeholder. Thank you. I second it. Mm. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, do we have any discussion? And this is the point for discussion, not halfway through the work. Kathy Sylvester says that, said that, seconded it. Great, that's right, sorry about that. Is there any discussion? All right. Rachel, aren't you glad you're at the top of the alphabetical list tonight? Who do you blame? Rachel Blaine, um, I'm gonna vote no. I think it, I'm gonna leave the pressure on. Okay. Uh, Andrea. Andrea Leibson, I vote yes. I don't think we have enough information. Mm -hmm. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba, yes. And Annalie Wolfkull, yes. So the um, motion passes. Okay. We have 
another zoning bylaw proposal. <laughs> but this is a, a relatively, I, I believe, a relatively easy one. Um, we, I, I think this, actually the select board a while ago, a number of months, if not years ago, decided to call themselves the select board instead of the board of selectmen. But my understanding is that it never really got officially put through with all, with the general laws as well as the zoning bylaws. So um, general bylaws are going to be addressed about changing the terminology from board of selectmen to the select board. And we need to um, have a, uh, uh, similar um a hearing here a public hearing right? a hearing yes right. right uh vote to have a public hearing to um address this and then um bring it forward to town meeting also so then that would in fact be the process we'd have a public it will be it would be we would vote on it tonight it would be posted um our next regularly scheduled meeting is june 7th um, if it then is, we, if we move it forward to the town, uh, meeting at that point, it would be approved at town meeting. And then some lucky soul gets to go through all the zoning bylaws and mm -hmm. check, change all the, the verbiage. So, so mm -hmm. I, I just would like to say the, um, give you a little bit of background on this. The select board years ago voted to become a select board and not a board of select men. And what happened is our bond council, when we went to the USDA to borrow money for the sewer treatment plant, it um, went through our bylaws and found that we did not change our bylaws from board of select, from select men to select board. And so this is to, um, so we can continue to borrow money <laughs> from the USDA and get a grant, get the USDA grant, which is the most important thing. So um, it is actually, it is a housekeeping thing, but it is extremely important from a financial impact. So um, I'm sorry that we have to go through this. We did not realize that we did not do this or this was part of it, but um, it actually has tremendous impact. And it is our USDA grant that is at risk if we don't do this. So thank you for taking time. It is incredibly appropriate. <laughs> Annalie, can I just ask a question? So I, I, I totally agree. I've always had, I've had an issue with calling the select, select board of select men because obviously you're not a man. So are you going to be referred to as our select woman from now on? May sound nope. a little bit. We are no, just a select, select board, board member. member. Okay, that's we are, fine. We are a select board member. We are sort of gender neutral. That's um, great. We've sort of always referred to us for many years that way. And then we finally realized that we had to do an official vote, but then we never followed through with all the bylaw changes okay. because it just never occurred to us to tell you the truth. Um, well, I like the gender neutral, thank you. Yeah, because you're not and all men. As a point of interest, it's probably the nicest thing people say about us in town. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that, oh man, that we have to do. Mm. Okay. We want to do. Yes. <laughs> we want to do. All right. So our next planning board meeting is scheduled for June 7th. Um, so, um, and I don't believe there's terrible urgency to have the public hearing prior to that. So if everyone is in agreement, we'll have a public hearing on this at our planning board meeting on June 7th. Good. Okay. Also, just you don't have to take a formal vote, but the consensus would be that you would be supportive of us keeping the select board, keeping a placeholder for this warrant article um, once you've had the public hearing. It's already there. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm just it. asking. <laughs> I'm just asking that the bond council. I, I'm just asking that the planning board doesn't have any issue with that. Do we need to do anything officially with that? I don't know. Okay. Because we're with the select board controls the warrant, but I just wanted to make sure that nobody felt that we were jamming it down their throat. That's all. So we, no. As long as everyone's okay with it. Oh yeah. That's just timing is <laughs> corrective action. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I don't believe we have any other business not reasonably anticipated 40 hours prior, do we? No, 
Well then, our next meetings. Um, everybody remember that on May 26th, the um, Select Board is having a town meeting info night. And I don't know, I think the planning board is like monopolizing the whole evening <laughs> or much of it because we've got a lot of um, bylaws that are coming forward. And this will, be, this will in fact be an excellent opportunity for us to receive you know, public comments about things. So everybody, if you can talk it up and certainly come and um, let's hope we've got a Zoom that just comes that close to crashing because there's so many people. <laughs> um, so the May 26th, the Select Board Town Meeting Info Night, uh, June 7th, the Planning Board and June 12th, the Town Meeting. And uh, if I don't hear anything else, if I could have a motion to adjourn. Hey, I'm sorry, Annalise. Yes. <laughs> Just one more thing. So this is a joint meeting and this is so we can reduce the comment during our town meeting just to help people to inform them. How are we going to inform the town that we are having this joint meeting? How, how are we gonna get the word out? How's that happening? I think that would be Carolyn and David. We Does announced that, mean... that our, our select board meeting, it's put on the town website. It's on, would be on Facebook. Um, okay. The normal, I mean, the problem is there's, it's very much different people get their sources from very different right. places so it's, it's very hard to to get everybody but mm -hmm. we will do the normal explanation and the uh, and the idea is to eliminate questions not only in the zoning but the budget right. and yeah. you know stuff so that um people can think about it and mm -hmm. and and we can anticipate some of the questions because it's very hard sometimes to get a question out of the blue that maybe you hadn't even thought about. So um, the idea is to sort of get an anticipation of the kind of questions and so that you'll have your presentation can be geared to um, you know what people's concerns are. Great, thank you. Um, hopefully, um, maybe you've already planned a robocall, but that would be nice. It would also speak ahead to the town meeting. Yeah. What, what we would do is do one combined robocall that would, you know, remind people that town meeting is June 12th and that we have the info May, night on May 26th. Do we have, Annalie, do we have any, um, any word from Dollar General about this art meeting in June? Nope. <laughs> Jennifer? I just wanted to remind the board that even for the information night, we had those little blurbs that are gonna to go to the select, that we need 12 days before town meeting. So yeah. that would be, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, could we have a motion to adjourn? Well, should we talk about how those blurbs are gonna get written? Oh, well, we did last, at our last meeting. I know. Oh, that um, Lily Dwight, and I, do? Um, I have worked together on the one for formula based okay, businesses. Good. Chris is working on the solar and accessory yeah. part, or well, <laughs> and uh, site plan review and the, um, the you know, I think, uh, one Casey, yeah, Casey, you'll be working with. I mean, I don't think there's much with the select board, board of selectmen, and the um, dimensional use would be coming through Casey and the, the select, board. select board. Okay. Yeah, we can we could do something quick. Yeah. I mean, there isn't too much to say one way or the other, but we can Good. certainly all right. All you right. know, have a have a little you know sound bite for both of them. Right. These, this is for the uh, the twenty sixth as well as the booklet that's going out to the um, residents. Basically, it allows us to create the talking points that we can use and refine. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Carolyn, yeah. you wanna make a motion to adjourn the select board? Yes, I will make, this is Carolyn Ness. I will make the motion to um, adjourn the select board meeting. This is Dave Wolfram, second up. <laughs> All those in favor. Hi, <laughs> Carolyn Ness. Hi, Dave Wolfram. All right. Thank I you for that a good we evening. Adjourn the planning board. Can you? Wait, yeah. did you? Rachel Blaine. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. <laughs> All right, uh, you you know the alphabet now, Rachel. Rachel Blaine, yes.
um, Denise, no, not no, Denise. Andrea. Andrea. And, Andrea, yes, right. Andrea Leibson, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wachroba, yes. Emily Wolfkull, yes. All right, the meeting is- Thank you. Great. Thank you all for being uh, sharing the meeting with us tonight. Oh, <laughs> oh you're welcome. <laughs> like to play well with others, Carolyn. <laughs> it's very pleasant, actually. I just Good. want you to know. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. All, all right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 See you tomorrow.